Lecture three, the Eucharist, the real presence of Christ to the heart of the worthy recipient. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to thee, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, that we may be wholly thine, utterly dedicated unto thee. And then use us, we pray thee, as thou wilt, and always to thy glory and the welfare of thy people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn this week to the Eucharist, or Eucharistic theology. What I want to suggest at the beginning of this lecture is that the debates about the Eucharist per se were actually caught up in a larger Christological debate, which is to say the, the finer points of Eucharistic theology regarding the status of the bread and the wine and what sense Christ is present or not within the bread and the wine were not the larger, more significant questions that the church had to ask. Rather, they were just one aspect of a larger Christological question, which was this. How is Christ present to the church today? Or to put it somewhat differently, how does Christ fulfill that promise he made at the end of Matthew's gospel to his disciples? Lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. So you see, the, the Eucharistic debates were a part of this larger question regarding the presence of Christ to the church. Now, let's not make a mistake right at the beginning. The question is not whether or not the divine Son of God is present to us. For indeed, as John's Gospel puts it, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. Which seems to suggest that the divine Son of God has been present to creation from the very beginning. But when we ask the question, how is Christ present to the church, we're asking not simply about divine presence, but we're asking how the Son of God made man is present to the church. How Christ in his human nature, uh, in his sanctified human flesh, is present to the church. And, and the difference is significant. For the flesh of Christ, which was crucified for us, and was raised again, and now is seated at the right hand of the Father, that flesh which is now transfigured and sanctified, having been sacrificed for our sake, that flesh is the wellspring of eternal life. And so if Christ is merely present as God to us, but not also present to us as the Son of God made man in his very transfigured flesh, which is for the light, given for the life of the world, well, then that seems to cast doubt on the legitimacy of Christ's promise to the church that he would be with us to the very end of the age. And so you see the question of real presence in the Holy Eucharist is caught up within this larger question of the real presence of Christ's transfigured and saving flesh. Is Christ present to us as the human being who has conquered death by means of the divine might he possessed as a divine person? Do we have union with the very body of Christ? That is the question, and the real presence, that's what it is referring to. I'm going to talk in this lecture about three different things. In the first section of this lecture, I want to give a, a large bird's eye view, a wide angle lens view of the Reformation debates regarding the real presence. I then want to investigate in the following two sections, the Eucharistic theology of Thomas Cranmer and then Richard Hooker, asking how these two uh, important Anglican theologians figure into those larger debates about the real presence of uh, the divine Son of God made man to the church. But briefly, let me indicate what I intend to argue over the course of this lecture. It's this. For both Cranmer and Hooker, 
Christ in his body and blood, the very sanctified flesh of Jesus Christ, which is the wellspring of salvation, is present to the believer in the receiving of the bread and the wine. Only that presence of Christ's body and blood is located not in the bread and the wine themselves, but rather in the heart of the believer by faith, which feeds on him uh, within the heart. In a nutshell, that's the argument. But first, in this section of the lecture, let me turn to the background, the larger Christological debate, which has a Eucharistic element that is happening within the Church Catholic within the 16th century. Despite the common misconception, the Reformation debates did not hinge on whether or not to affirm the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. No, the crucial issue was instead how to affirm the real presence of Christ in Holy Communion, while still affirming the local heavenly presence of Christ at the right hand of the Father. So how to affirm the real presence, given that Christ in his flesh, which he uh, will continue to bear for all of eternity, given that Christ in his flesh has ascended to the right hand of the Father and is there seated in the throne of all executive authority, how can Christ also be present to the church in and through his sanctified flesh? That's the question. So there are really a number of issues that need to be addressed in order for a theologian or for a church to give a persuasive answer to that question. How does Christ fulfill that promise? Lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. I mean, just think for a moment about that promise. Jesus says, I will be with you until the end of the age, uh, just before he ascends to the right hand of the Father and seemingly leaves the church and is absent to it. But the Reformation uh, churches, for the most part, as we'll see, wanted to affirm is that though Christ is present at the right hand of the Father, he is also present in and through his flesh to the church, thereby constituting the church as his very body as it enjoys union with him. There are three main questions that I want to focus on that sort of form the, uh, the parameters for answering this question. The, the three are this, the local presence of Christ in heaven, in what way do we affirm that? I'll talk about that in a moment. The real presence of Christ to us, in what way can we affirm that? And if Christ is really and truly present to the church, his body and blood uh, are available for the, uh, the church's participation and union, uh, how do we understand the mode of presence? So we have the local presence of Christ in heaven. We have the real presence of Christ to us in the church here and now. And we have the mode or the manner of that presence. Let me talk about each of these for just a moment. Uh, the local presence of Christ in heaven is an important issue if we are going to properly understand the incarnation. According to the doctrine of the incarnation, Christ has two natures. He is uh, from all eternity the divine Son of God, and as such he has the qualities of God, the properties of God, such as omniscience and omnipresence, and especially omnipresence is important here. However, he has also adopted, assumed a true and uh, genuine human nature with all of the limitations that Im implies. Uh, he is like us in every way except sin. And so even in heaven, at the right hand of the Father, where Christ has ascended after completing his earthly work, he has a real bodily existence. And that bodily existence must be a finite and therefore not omnipresent existence. Christ has a body like our own. That body has been transfigured and it has been perfected. 
and it has been imbued with uh, a partic imbued with the very life of God, for the divine Son made man is indeed God himself. And yet that flesh still is subject to the limitations of finitude, which means it cannot be this flesh of Christ cannot be in more than one place at the same time. Now this is the initial problem uh, that is posed to any theology that wants to affirm the real presence of Christ in his flesh, the body and blood of Christ. How do we affirm real presence if Christ is locally present in heaven, subject to still the limitations of finitude? That flesh is not omnipresent. So, uh, in order to affirm the real presence, a theologian or a church has to explain the manner of Christ's presence. This is the mode of presence, given that he is really present here, but nevertheless still only locally present at the right hand of the Father. So these are the parameters. Every one of these questions has to be answered, but depending on how you answer each one, you have a different construal of the real presence. Um, if this is a little bit murky in your mind at the moment, let me go through how various churches have coped with uh, uh, these questions, and then hopefully it'll be a little bit clearer in your mind. But, but keep in mind, as we're talking about Eucharistic theology, we're really talking about a Christological question. How is the human being, Christ, the divine Son of God, made man, present to the church? Let me first talk about uh, what was at that point the traditional view, which was challenged, of course, by the reformers. I can pull this up here. There it is. Uh, the Roman Catholic view. Uh, this view draws heavily upon Thomas Aquinas, and as I present this, I'm relying on Aquinas's distinctions in order to make this clear, uh, simply because. Aquinas had the most refined uh, and sophisticated view of this position. This position is often called transubstantiation, and you see in your notes uh, I have that uh, written. What the Roman Catholic Church at the time affirmed, uh, relying on Aquinas, was that the humanity of Christ is indeed present bodily in heaven. So there was, as you see here, an affirmation of the local presence of Christ's humanity, of Christ's flesh, uh, at the right hand of the Father. And, and the only local presence, the only presence within a place that Christ's humanity has is in heaven, whatever that means. That's a, uh, a difficult question to sort of comprehend what it means to... Uh, be present in heaven, but nevertheless that was the position. However, the Roman Catholic Church clearly affirmed real presence, and so though Christ is present locally in heaven, he is also really present uh, in his flesh and blood on the altar uh, within every Catholic Church. How was this explained? Well, the mode of presence was transubstantiation, a substantial change of the elements. So, through a miracle, Christ is present substantially in the sacrament of the bread and the wine, as the substance of Christ's body replaces the substance of the body, uh, of the, the bread and the wine, while allowing the accidents or the physical uh, observable properties of the bread and the wine to remain. Maybe I should state that again. Through a miracle of God's omnipotence, the substance of the bread and the wine, which is their, their ontological reality, what a thing is, that's its substance. Not necessarily what it looks like or smells like or feels like or tastes like, but what it is. The substance of the bread and the wine through this miracle of omnipotence is changed and replaced by the substance of Christ's body and blood. So, though the, the bread and the wine look and feel and taste and smell like bread and wine, those accidents or physical properties remain, the reality, 
The underlying ontological reality is that this is Christ's body and blood. And so Christ is locally present in heaven. He's really present upon the altar within the church through a miraculous and substantial change of the elements. And so where is the real presence of Christ's flesh and blood to be found? Within the bread and the wine themselves. For the bread and the wine is Christ's body and blood. There's a lot more to say about this position, uh, but let that suffice for now. Second position is the Lutheran position. This is often called consubstantiation. Uh, Luther himself never used that term, but it, it is an apt description or term for what Luther did argue. Uh, Luther and the Lutheran tradition wants to affirm the real presence. And it affirms the real presence in uh, a unique way, let us say. According to this position, the human nature of Christ, that human nature, including the flesh and blood that the divine Son of God has assumed, shares in the properties of divinity. One of the properties of divinity is omnipresent. God is at all places at all times. If the humanity of Christ shares in that omnipresence by virtue of the, the hypostatic union, you know, the incarnation whereby he assumes human nature, then that means the body and blood of Christ can likewise be present everywhere. It can be omnipresent for the Son of God is omnipresent. So, because the humanity of Christ shares in the omnipresence of his divinity, this is called ubiquity, it's present everywhere, therefore the body and the blood of Christ can be substantially present in, through, and under the elements of the bread and the wine. So we see here, because Luther, let's say, relaxed the requirements of local presence in heaven uh, through a, a novel interpretation of the, the hypostatic union. Therefore, there's no obstacle now to him being really present in the very bread and the wine themselves. He's present in, through, and under those elements of bread and wine. And so here we see a different position than the Roman Catholic position, but notice how both of them affirm regarding the mode of presence that Christ is present within the very elements themselves. So there's a kind of objectivity to the presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. He's there outside of ourselves, regardless of whether we believe he is there or not. He's there within these elements of bread and wine. Now a very different position is what often is called memorialism or Zwinglianism. According to this position, uh, largely developed by Ulrich Zwingli, who was a Swiss reformer, uh, whose influence, let's say, on American Christianity has been uh, en enormous, the humanity of Christ is present exclusively in heaven. Therefore, the body and blood of Christ cannot be truly or really present within the bread and the wine. And consequently, when we talk about mode of presence, it's rather an absence. The bread and the wine are symbols or tokens only of the flesh and blood of Christ, which are uh, absent to the church. So when a Zwinglian takes communion, what he or she thinks is happening is that there is an enjoyment by faith of the benefits of which Christ has won for us in the flesh, but we are not partaking of that flesh itself. We enjoy the benefits that have come to us over the, the centuries, 2,000 years later, by what Christ did on the cross and in the resurrection uh, in the flesh, but we are not united to that flesh. So here we see a strong affirmation of local presence, which makes it impossible now to affirm a real presence of Christ's sanctified flesh to the church. I didn't mean to hit that button. Well, we're going there anyway. A fourth position 
is another Reformed position, but the Reformed position that stems from John Calvin. Uh, it may su surprise some, uh, but John Calvin uh, did want to, and indeed did, affirm the real presence of Christ's body and blood to the church. He affirmed the local presence of Christ in heaven at the right hand of the Father, which cannot be, unlike Luther's position, present in more places than one at a time, and yet he also affirmed the real presence of Christ's body and blood to the believer. And here's how he articulated that. The humanity of Christ is present in heaven, local presence, but the Holy Spirit, and think about the Holy Spirit for a moment, the Holy Spirit is not bound by distances or differences in time, spans of time. Um, they are as nothing to the Holy Spirit, who is God and therefore omnipresent. So, though the, the humanity of Christ is present solely in, at the right hand of the Father, through the Holy Spirit who traverses distances, Calvin says, uh, the recipient of the bread and the wine who receives by faith is united to the resurrected and ascended Christ. United even, Calvin says, to the realities of Christ's flesh and blood. And so therefore, in Holy Communion, Christ is substantially present through the Spirit to our faith. And so in the mode of presence, the mode of presence is a spiritual presence that is uh, created through the Holy Spirit. Uh, let me just say one word about, well, maybe a couple words, about mode of presence. Uh, let's think about this uh, terminology for a moment. When I shake hands with a friend, which I haven't done that in a while in this uh, pandemic world, when I shake hands with a friend, I am present bodily to my friend. Or when I kiss my wife, I am present in a bodily way to my wife. There's actually contact of flesh. And so that would, the mode of presence there is a corporeal or bodily presence. Now suppose I cannot meet with my friend. Uh, and so instead we, uh, we meet via Zoom. And you all are feeling fatigue, just at the mere mention of Zoom. I am not now bodily present, or I don't enjoy a corporeal mode of presence with my friend, and yet through the exchange of words and facial expressions, linguistic exchange with my friend, we are indeed present to one another, but it's not a bodily presence. Uh, it is rather, we could call it a, a spiritual presence or a linguistic presence. Uh, we are united through uh, the words and the spirit of the words that we are speaking to one another. So there's a presence there, and yet it is, uh, and it's a real presence, it's just not a bodily presence. So our spirits are present to one another, even though our bodies are separate. So we have a, a spiritual presence there, um, and in the earlier example of shaking hands or kissing my wife, it is a corporeal presence. Our bodies are in uh, proximity and in contact with one another. Here is what Calvin is saying. He is not saying that uh, we enjoy only a spiritual presence or only the spiritual presence of Christ such that his body is not present to us. Uh, he's actually some, saying something different. I couldn't come up with an analogy for this, possibly because there is no possible analogy. It's, it's, it's a unique situation. What Calvin is saying is that we are indeed present to the body and blood of Christ, or rather the body and the blood of Christ are present to us, but in a spiritual mode. So we, we don't have physical contact with Christ. We have spiritual contact with Christ, but we have a spiritual contact not with merely his spirit, but with his body and blood. So if you can wrap your mind around that, you will now be better equipped to understand what Calvin is trying to say. And I paused uh, to reflect a little bit more on Calvin's position, which is, which is often called receptionism. Um, some call it virtualism, but I think that's wrong and I don't have time to explain why. I think this is a receptionist position. 
as the believer receives the bread and the wine, uh, she enjoys a spiritual, the spiritual presence of Christ's very and true body and blood. For the Holy Spirit is not bound by distances in space and time. He can bridge those distances by virtue of his divine omnipotence and omnipresence. So in the mystery of the Holy Spirit, we are united spiritually to Christ's body and blood. And so that's the distinction between Calvin and Zwingli. For Zwingli, we are not spiritually present to the body and blood of Christ. Rather, the body and the blood of Christ are absent to us, and so therefore we only have a spiritual presence of God in his divine nature, not Christ in his human nature. So, four different approaches to the question, how is Christ present to the church? And notice how three of them uh, three of the mainstream positions within the church in the 16th century uh, found a way to affirm the real presence of Christ in his sanctified and transfigured flesh to the church. The first through the miracle of transubstantiation. The second through the miracle, let's say, of the ubiquity of Christ's human nature. And then the third, the, the Calvinist reform position through the working of the Holy Spirit who bridges the divide between heaven and earth and unites us spiritually to the body and blood of Christ that are now seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, with, with this background in mind, let us in the next section of the lecture turn to Thomas Cranmer's position uh, asking ourselves how he uh, answers this Christological and Eucharistic question of Christ's presence to the church. <laughs>